Okay, thanks very much. And a big hello to uh, to all participants. I mean, it's uh, a, a, a good late afternoon from Europe, but I guess from participants from diff different parts of the world, we uh, we we limited to a, 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 a good day and a welcome. Uh, first of all, uh, we are thrilled to participate in this symposium, which is dedicated to uh, to the role of cellular agriculture technology in space. I mean, for us for us all in the general public domain. This is extremely exciting to see the recent development and to consider it from the space perspective is 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 becoming very very interesting. So uh, maybe uh, uh, to please allow to introduce myself, uh, I'm Rob Postema. Uh, I'm with the European Space Agency in the uh, Human and Robotics Exploration. Uh, uh, department or directorate, and I'm coordinating the technology demonstrators, uh, which are planned from ESA to be flown to ISS in Columbus. And uh, one of the activities in this area is to support further evaluation and demonstrations of solutions in cellular agriculture. And together, I'm joined, uh, as already introduced by Alex, but Jonathan Scott, who is uh, uh, coordinating the uh, the implementation of uh, medical and life support solutions for future immense spaceflight or human spaceflight. And Joao Garcia, who is a research fellow uh, uh, at ESA, investigating the feasibility of uh, cellular cal uh, culture. Uh, and cellular agriculture solutions, a cultivated meat for uh, for future spaceflight. And I also understand uh, another colleague of mine, Paolo Corradi, uh, who is the uh, technical officer for some of the projects I will introduce, is also uh, uh, joining us. So uh, without further ado, I would say let's go to the scope of this uh, this presentation. First, uh, I would like to uh, to present the uh, the ESA, the interest. Why are we as ESA interested uh, in cellular agriculture as a food system, uh, and uh, why are we looking at specific solutions there? Uh, we will also provide a short overview of the needs and the constraints uh, which arise when we're going to implement such solutions uh, in space. I mean, this is not always as straightforward. I mean, it's usually not a copy and paste of terrestrial systems. We have to take into account some aspects which are typical for space. Um, and then I will let you in on some, some uh, interesting activities which are ongoing uh, at ESA and also uh, the opportunities to work and collaborate with ESA in supporting the, the, the future deployment of these solutions in space investigations, as well as the benefit we may have from these solutions on Earth. Going to the European Space uh, Agency, uh, what are we? Uh, maybe for some, uh, this is uh, very well known for others, this might be a new organization. Um, we're the Europe's gateway to space. It's, it's an agency like NASA, like JAXA, like Roscosmos, uh, she is a Canadian space agency. And it is mission is to develop the European space capability and to ensure that investment in space continues to deliver benefits to the citizens and uh, not only of Europe, but, but worldwide. It's an international organization uh, with 22 member states, uh, mainly European. There's some associated member states like, uh, like Canada. And we do coordinate the financial and electoral, elect, elect, intellectual resources of our members. So we undertake uh, uh, programs and activities in scope of European countries. And uh, what we do in support of that is together with our member states and the delegate for our member states, we draw up a program and we implement this program on an, a, a time frame of three to four years. So each three or four years, the, the program is, uh, is, is under discussion, is uh, being updated, is being renewed where necessary. And uh, then we, we upgrade it and we implement it as ESA meaning that we are funded uh, by our member states and we make sure that the industry from our member states uh, gets the assignments to develop their innovation capabilities and their products in support of space. Where can we find ESA? Um, well, mostly, uh, of course, uh, with, with some offices uh, all over the world, we mainly uh, uh, settled in... Uh, 
in Europe with our headquarters in Paris, the astronaut training center in Cologne, Germany, uh, our science center in uh, near Madrid in Spain. We have an operation center for we, from which we uh, uh, manage our satellite, control our satellite, which is in Darmstadt. The data center uh, processing uh, data from Earth observation satellites, for instance, is uh, near Rome in Italy. And uh, the, by far the largest center of, uh, of ESA is uh, in the Netherlands. It's the Technology and Research Center. And it's uh, close to the coast in a small town called Noordwijk. Recently, we established uh, an innovation center for space applications and telecommunications in Harwell. And in uh, Belgium, near Redu, we have the uh, European Space Security and Education Center. So, unlike some of our other space agencies uh, and international partners, ESA covers all areas of space activities, which means space science, human spaceflight, exploration, Earth observation, space transportation, uh, launchers, navigation, as well as the operations and the safety of space, uh, not only in, in terms of security of data, etc., but also more recent uh, uh, and, and very urgent topic like, uh, like space debris. And this makes ESA in a sense unique. Um, the budget for ESA is is not as far as, as large as our main partners in the, in the world like NASA. It's it's around six and a half billion euros, and with that we make sure that uh, the the industry uh, in Europe, industrial organizations, research research and development organizations, and universities can develop their capability ability to, to support the space infrastructure. As said, one of the uh, directorates of ESA, one of the topics for ESA is uh, human uh, spaceflight and robotic exploration. And uh, we are aiming uh, at, at three destinations in our strategy, I would say. We have already in place the, uh, the low Earth orbits, economy, which is the uh, the Columbus module, which is attached to the International Space Station. And there we're working together with our international partners to operate this. And at the moment, uh, Samantha Kistrefietti is one of our astronauts who is on board uh, Columbus and uh, will soon be operating as a, as a commander, as the first female commander of, uh, of ISS. At this moment, we are working together with NASA on the uh, the going back to the moon, uh, where uh, we have uh, contributed to the Orion spacecraft. And uh, apart from that, getting boots on the moon, as they say, uh, we're also looking at the future uh, uh, of Mars as a destination. And if you're looking at it, uh, this um, in in the programmatic sense of what we are doing. Uh, in human and robotics exploration is we have the cornerstones as 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 mentioned here uh, so the humans uh, in low earth orbit international space station uh, possibly developing further into uh, into a more commercially uh, approached uh, uh, entity um, beyond leo we're going to the deep space gateway cornerstone uh, 2 which is a, a small space station orbiting uh, the moon in one of the Lagrange points. And uh, this will evolve into lunar robotic as well as human exploration. And eventually we're looking at uh, on the near term on Mars robotic exploration, uh, human uh, exploration of Mars being uh, uh, quite far on the horizon. These two programs uh, are supported by what we call SciSpace, which is enabling scientists to do research on the platforms we are developing. Uh, today, mainly uh, the International Space Station, as you can imagine, the space station, uh, but also thinking about what kind of science can be done on the Deep Space Gateway. And then on the left side, you see Expert, which is the program to develop uh, technology uh, at, a, at an early stage. So it's, it's really looking at um, 
technologies which are of very low technology ready le readiness level, which can be uh, flown at the later stage. And this program uh, identifies which technologies are needed, as well as develops the early stages to mature and becoming part of what we call the cornerstones, so CS124. When we're looking at, uh, at human exploration, uh, to get, today we have the space station and we see that uh, we need to fulfill uh, the basic needs also of the crew there. Uh, so food, drinks is essential, life support is essential. And what we see here is that in the, in the, in the International Space Station, uh, we have regular supply missions. So we can regularly supply food uh, to the crew on board there, which at the moment are, are six. And uh, this is a mix of, uh, of fresh food, which is uh, typically uh, supplied when the supply mission, of course, is arriving and, uh, and can, be, uh, can be eaten and drinked at that time. And then between the missions, when we're a little bit longer ahead and after a, a mission, uh, a supply mission docks, there's the pre-packed food, uh, which is uh, dealt with. This means a lot of uh, everything needs to be prepared on Earth, needs to be supplied to the space station, which is relatively short uh, in distance. It's 480 kilometers, 450 kilometers, and there are regular supply missions. And it creates quite a lot of waste also, which can be taken back with these supply missions. If we're going to longer duration missions, um, well, we have a few challenges. Um, first of all, uh, astronauts are exposed for a longer time to the extreme space uh, conditions. Uh, the current space food systems, as I was describing, uh, may not be able to provide the adequate nutrition. Um, what, what we see is that shelf life is limited. Uh, we have to take care of a very limitation, a uh, limitation of, of uh, supply missions. I mean, if we're talking about a, a Mars transfer habitat uh, for a crew, you just can't send a supply mission to this Mars, uh, uh, to this transfer habitat because it's on its way. So basically we'll be chasing the, the, the transfer vehicle. Uh, to the moon, it's a little bit in the middle, but still it becomes more and more expensive. So what we are looking for, uh, also to reduce the packaging and to make sure that everything is there is to consider alternative food and drink supply solutions to crew. In what kind of environment, and now I'm coming back to the introduction, is that it may not be the same as, as on Earth. Um, we have to take a lot of considerations into account before we can implement these food and drink supply solutions. Uh, on, on the right side, you have an overview of what uh, the average intake per day, uh, what, what is the, the, the needed average intake per day. And um, you see that this is, well, it's comparable to an active person. Uh, but it, it needs to take account for certain um, uh, environmental effects which are in uh, in space. And on the on the left side, you see the the kind of I would say high level considerations uh, we have to take into account, not only from the food position itself. So, what's the nutrition of the food? What's the palatability? What's the variety? Um, which is very important, especially if you're going on a, on a mission which, which takes us over a year to several years. Uh, I mean, you get the psychological uh, aspects, et cetera, of, of food. So you need to get the variety, the taste, uh, the texture, et cetera, to be taken into consideration. But also introducing a solution like that in a space habitat in, for instance, something which is similar to the Columbus module on ISS, suddenly you're in a space environment, uh, you're faced with a uh, lack of gravity, which has an influence on how everything works. You're, uh, you have elevated radiation, which may affect the food as well as the instrumentation. 
safety is extremely important on board. We have to keep the crew safe. We have to keep the habitat safe. Uh, so what kind of materials are you using there? Uh, can there be contamination or not? What's the cleanliness uh, in the end also on the long term? Uh, associated with that, what's the long term stability? Not only in terms of, uh, of cleanliness, but also, I mean, when you have four crew on board or six crew on board, then not everybody is an expert in the instrumentation uh, providing this, uh, these, these products. So it needs to be basically free of any maintenance uh, and the maintenance, if any, should be kept very simple, maybe to cleaning, uh, maybe to replacing uh, larger parts. I mean, as kind of cartridges, but you don't have a workshop there, uh, mechanical, electrical. So you have to, to all make that source uh make make a, a, to all consider that at, at, at an early stage and then also you don't have unlimited resources in terms of power in terms of supplies uh, in terms of being able to generate waste so also this needs to be taken into account and this is at at the moment where we also are considering okay what what kind of requirements following the type of missions we're doing we are uh, we are looking at so in the next slide, explain this a little bit more in detail and 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 uh, and summarize it uh, summarizes it. Um, also, depending on what bioprocesses uh, you take, what's your resources, how can you minimize them? I mean, we already see, for instance, with uh, uh, cultured meat, that as uh, compared to animal meat, the, the the water consumption is substantially going lower, uh, but still it is there. Uh, so we have to look at how do we uh, provide the water in, in these kind of solutions? How how we get this from regenerative systems? Uh, how can we retrieve water? I mean, it's already happening in, in ISS, but it's on an experimental scale. So what alternative foods and drink supply solutions are there? Um, we have the plants and vegetables. There's a lot of research is being done on that. I will not go into detail there. I mean, the, the, the website of ESA provides a lot of information on that and is, uh, is extremely uh, um, interesting what is done there. Uh, there's a lot of activities going on on the uh, microalgae and, uh, and bacteria. So how can you produce biomass? Uh, how does it get into closed loop? systems and one of the big projects ESA is coordinated already for quite some uh, long time uh, given its complexity is the Melissa project which is a, a project on the circular life support systems providing food water and oxygen and uh, what we see is that there is a reference plant uh, I think it is in in, in Spain and uh, I will come back to that later and the colleagues can give a lot of information on that and we see that uh, parts of this project are now developing into technology demonstrators to see how this would work in a microgravity environment, in space environment. Last but not least, uh, cellular agriculture and cultivated meat. And this is, I would say, the, uh, the starting point was uh, of this, this presentation uh, because it's, 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 it, it finds itself in a, in a big uh, and, and uh, large interest of uh, of ESA uh, with with quite a few activities so we're looking at the production of agricultural products uh, animal products uh, using the these the cell culturing techniques and we see a lot of terrestrial uh, uh, solutions also we think later today there's the the presentation uh, by Pascal Rosenfeld from Aleph Food and there I'm, I'm pretty sure there are different other uh, presentations on this topic as well I'm looking forward to uh, to listen into so given this and given the interest of ESA in, in this area, and uh, we have some examples now on plant and vegetables, the Melissa project, but what are we doing on, on cellular agriculture and cultivated meat? Uh, first of all, um, I would like to, to also have a disclaimer that we're looking at cellular agriculture in itself, so creating cells in a bioreactor, 
we could also imagine, and that's what we're looking for, different applications. So you could look at generating cells, for instance, for medical applications. You could uh, look at, at, at generating cells for uh, scientific investigation, for meat production, uh, for, 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 for tissue generation. So there's, there's quite a few applications we're looking at and might be synergies between that. So I, I, the, the, the presentation of what, what, uh, what, I, what this includes is also um, uh, some of the um, projects we've done or are doing, which are not directly related to uh, cultivated meat, but we do benefit from these studies also. So one which has been completed some time ago uh, and, and you will see the companies uh, who have done this uh, um, uh, in, in the slide is uh, an activity on uh, the, the 3D printing of, uh, of living tissues. And it evaluated, it was a feasibility study looking at the potential of bioprinting technologies and how this would work out in, in space and in space exploration. So different mission scenarios are uh, identified and uh, what would be the most suitable technologies. And uh, this at the moment is, is uh, activities closed some time ago and we're thinking about a, uh, a follow on to that. Then uh, the next slide, and I understand uh, my colleague uh, Paolo Corradi is, uh, is, is also listening in, so uh, he can tell a lot more about that, is we recently started two studies to assess the feasibility of cultured meat production in long-term space missions uh, far from Earth. Um, so using Mars and Moon as reference scenarios, and it's it started under, I'll come back to that later, uh, the discovery element of the ESA basic activities, basically uh, one way of doing business with ESA. Uh, one of the consortia is uh, composed of, uh, of URI from Germany, the Reutlingen University, and the other uh, uh, project is UK-based, uh, Kaiser Space with uh, uh, subcontractor Cellular Agriculture and Camden. And here also we're looking uh, at, at the first steps low technology readiness level, uh, feasibility studies to see um, what kind of solutions there are for creating cultivated meat in space and uh, what is the feasibility of introducing uh, these, what are the conditions, how can they meet the conditions and to evaluate these cultured meat system performances versus uh, uh, what are the alternatives because I mean, this is one way of generating proteins. You can, you can of course, understand that as ESA, uh, given all the restrictions we have, we, we, we look at different solutions, for instance, for uh, 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 generating proteins for long duration space flight. This is one of them, which is very promising. And uh, we're looking into that. The contexts are in the, uh, uh, in the presentation. Um, and uh, this will be made available, uh, the presentation afterwards. So there you can find uh, the, the context and uh, please specifically on what projects you're more than welcome to, uh, to approach uh, those who are referred to in the, in the presentation. Um, as already introduced, uh, Joao uh, Garcia is, uh, has recently joined ESA as a research fellow. And uh, he is also addressing uh, this manned spaceflight facility for cultivated meat. Um, looking at what are the key requirements, we have to start with the key requirements, both from a nutritional rate as well as what do you have to take into account to implement it. And there is some overlap with the, with the previous slide. Uh, so Zhao will also be looking at, uh, well, what kind of bioreactor could you have to the, to see whether you can use the same system for other cases, which I was mentioning, drug testing, medical applications, uh, tissue generation, maybe scientific experiments and uh, could actually a uh, uh, bioreactor be used for different uh, types of meat to be generated by that. And what would it take if it can, in terms of cleaning, in terms of reconfiguration, et cetera, et cetera. 
So we will make a trade-off. I mean, we're in, in contact and, and also through this presentation, uh, uh, reaching out to uh, solution providers for cultivated meat. Uh, we're happy to talk to you and to see how we can change information, help each other. So um, yeah, after this uh, CMS Astro, as well as just the presentation, I mean, you're invited to contact and I hope you will also not mind if we reach out to you after a, after a presentation. Then going to a different um, perspective on, on, on uh, 3D bioprinting and, and cell culture system. And this is, uh, and then I come back to when I show the, 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 the organization of uh, ESA's uh, human and robotics exploration that we have a scientific uh, a branch to that. And this is an, an activity which will be started, uh, which has started already uh, in uh, developing uh, a 3D bioprinter uh, and a 3D cell culture system, but in term in support of fundamental and applied research. So it's not going to be in towards a production facility. It's really opening possibilities for scientific and research communities to do experiments on an on a facility which has been developed by uh, by ESA. And and here you see. Uh, the different options for uh, uh, for this research. I'm, I'm not going to name them all. Uh, they will be there for reference. But it is through our scientific uh, team within, uh, within the directorate. Uh, names are there to be uh, reached out to. And what you see is that this is the planned activity. We will actually have a... Um, a 3D printer on board with a cultivation sample. Samples uh, uh, will be generated there. I mean, we will upload the cells and uh, the cartridges through uh, to ISS. It will be a, a relatively large instrument there with a, dry, a 3D bioprinter doing experiments. Um, this uh, facility will be developed by, uh, by European industry. And it is something which will be uh, hopefully contracted soon. In parallel to that, and that is the the, the hyperlink which is uh, below. There is an uh, from SciSpace. There is an announcement for opportunity to do uh, to uh, uh, and uh, call for ideas. If you have an idea for an experiment to be done on this uh, instrument, uh, you're welcome to visit this website and see how you can submit an idea like that. The development of the um, of the instrument itself, so the basic instrument, uh, will go through our, uh, um, I would say, standard procurement process. I'll come back to that uh, later. And uh, well, the, the the capabilities uh, can shortly uh, say that it's it's going to be a combination of two 3D bioprinting techniques, so micro extrusion and uh, drop on demands in CAT. Uh, the 3D volume will be in the order of centimeters, so uh, two by two by two centimeters or 30 uh, in a diameter height uh, in a cylindrical way. So there are different uh, possibilities there. Uh, of course, multiple samples can be printed and uh, they can be further processed on board for analysis. So if you don't want to compromise uh, the results of your experiment uh, by re-entry and handling on ground, which can affect that uh, depending on the way you, sorry for this, depending on the way you, uh, you process this or uh, so it can be directly after the uh, uh, the sample chamber or after the uh, the analysis. So this was an overview of the uh, uh, I would say the, the 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 activities. Some of the activities we have ongoing. Um, and a lot of a uh, lot is happening, and I I do invite you to take a, a look and keep a look at the uh, the ESA sites, and uh, maybe through. Uh, the web pages of uh, of this symposium, we can also uh, share some of the opportunities. Um, what we don't want to lose sight of is that 
ESA also has in its objective that Earth is benefiting from space. And what we see here is that this also offers the opportunity uh, for companies providing solutions in cellular agriculture and cultivated meat to do experiments on board for which they can benefit in developing their solutions and optimizing their solutions on Earth. That's one aspect of ESA. At the same time, ESA is also uh, um, an organization which, uh, uh, which uh, has the objective uh, to support the sustainability uh, goals uh, also from uh, uh, from the UN, UNICEF, and uh, one of these is that we will also be looking for uh, finding these solutions in our own restaurants uh, and uh, finding staff for that um, uh, as uh, as guinea pigs, I would say, initially. And then after the success, we can uh, include that more substantially. So this is, uh, so it also to the benefit and without if one of the listeners wants to not go with their solutions into space, but they want to do research in which space can be helpful, also here ESA can be uh, can be instrumental. So, what kind of solutions do we have to do uh, to do business with ESA? And this is this is, I would say, a general in a general overview. Um, there's a big website with that, uh, which is the uh, business with ESA one, the, the top one. And in general, the nominal business is that if ESA implements the program agreed with the member states, the uh, the contracts to industry for implementing the different activities in this program will go out through what we call an invitation to tender. So it's, uh, it is usually a competitive uh, uh, tender to representatives of our member states. So that means that uh, if you want to be a contractor or subcontractor, you need to be a representative uh, in, uh, in one of our member states. Uh, does it mean we exclude organizations from our uh, member states from doing business with ESA? No, but there are dedicated regulations for that. Uh, and uh, they're also described there and, and you can always uh, get in touch with me, but uh, the main option always is that uh, you will have to team up with uh, with representatives from our member states. Then in the early stages of uh, technology development, we have the Open Space Innovation Platform where you can actually submit ideas. And these are processed by ESA. And actually the, uh, the activity which is led by uh, 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 by Paolo, Paolo uh, is 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 also going through this uh, this uh, was going through this plot platform is now implemented. Uh, we have the business in space growth networks and the ESA commercial commercialization gateway, which are more offering um, space and services in the international space station inside the space station outside on platforms to be used on a commercial basis because we are more and more looking towards a commercial uh, uh, economy for low earth orbit facilities and then of course as already mentioned we have the uh, the fundamental research this is i would say a take from the many opportunities we have which we but which may be most relevant for uh, uh, for the ESA uh, uh and this specific topic we're we're discussing here so with that uh and the the opportunities we have I, I i hope i have given you a overview of the interest of isa in this specific topic uh and the added value of course we see in this uh, as well as the considerations for implementing this uh which are not only the solution itself but also Getting it, getting it getting it working in a space environment and getting it working for a longer time in a space environment. Uh, then the activities we already have, um, and for sure we will be building on this, uh, as well as the opportunities we have. So with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I would also like uh, to thank CMS Astro, Alex and his team very much uh, for uh, for the opportunity to uh, to present this keynote, uh, it's a pleasure to do, and uh, I'm I'm very happy that through this we can make our interest in this area known. And uh, also, big thanks to my colleagues for uh, 
providing me with all the slides and information to uh, to this presentation. So thanks for that. With that, I would like to give the word back to, uh, to Alex. Uh, I will stop sharing and make the presentation available through uh, through the uh, CMS platform. And uh, back to you, Alex. Great, thank you, Rob. So now uh, we have the opportunity to open it up to questions. Um, so at the bottom of your screen, you should have a Q&A tab. And so we're gonna be handling questions through that Q&A tab. And I see some questions are already coming in. Um, but, uh, uh, but uh, I also want to mention that you know PDFs, links, uh, contact information, and I believe the entire presentation will be able to be linked. So once the recording is available on the attendee agenda, uh, just take a look at that if you are interested in any of those links. Um, That's confirmed. And, awesome. And so um, we have a, a few questions here. Um, and one of them is from Nicholas, who asks, is there funding available for researchers in academia whose work could yield into results aligned with ESA's goals on the cellular agriculture. Uh, and I al also wanna mention, CZ, you had a similar type of question, um, but we'll get back to that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and answer live. And just to repeat, you know, is there funding available for research in academia whose you know, work might be aligned with e ESA, uh, especially for cellular agriculture? Um. I, I would prefer to uh, to uh, give this presentation to Angelique, uh, this, the answer to this question, uh, but since she's not there, yes, there are, uh, I mean, what we usually do through this call for ideas and through our, uh, um, uh, how should I say, uh, our scientific activities is they usually go through academic groups. So it's, it's consortia of academics uh, who are uh, providing these uh, these uh, ideas, and then usually through their individual organizations, uh, uh, students and uh, and researchers are allocated to the project. And um, ESA is funding these scientific activities. Uh, maybe uh, John, do you have something to add to this? Sure. Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, if you're looking specifically for PhDs or postdoctoral opportunities then under the ESA OSIP platform, there is an opportunity to propose um, academic, direct um, academic studies under there, which uh, ESA will, will part fund if you can bring the other half of the funding either from the university or from a uh, um, industrial organization. Um, yeah, as, as Rob said, some of the, the major technology development work that we do is done by consortiums of academia and industry. So um, it's quite often when we do a technology development, you will see uh, consortium coming forward with the solution. So there's a, a way of kind of participating in indirectly through a through a consortium or even directly as a prime if you if you qualify for for ESA funding. Um, yeah, and then we also use academic institutions for strategy development. So ESA SciSpace, for example, brings together academics from across Europe and asks them what should we be doing, where should we be going next? Um, and so it asks them, they're, they're called topical teams and um, we bring them together and they, they create a report and they say, These are, this is what's known, this is what isn't known, and this is where you should be going to fill those knowledge gaps. So there are definitely different ways in which uh, academics, either individually or as organizations, can participate and work with ESA. Great. Thank you. And so uh, we had a question that was very similar. Any student programs available for size space? I'm going to go ahead and just dismiss that question uh, from you, CZ. But um, you do have another question. You know, what about medicine? What if somebody becomes ill on board? Uh, maybe that's more related to the kind of storage of things. Uh, any, any insight on that for, for this question? How medicine is handled on, on board, maybe ISS? Uh, well, I can answer that, but I, I, I think John is the best to uh, to answer this uh, this question. Yeah, um, yeah. So it's it's a huge topic, but but very quickly, um, everything we do in space for human spaceflight is about risk reduction. So obviously, spaceflight is risky. Um, what we do is we try to identify all risks to human life. Uh, we try to identify how likely they are to happen statistically, which is not an easy thing to do. Um, we then try to identify if they were to happen, how bad would it be? Uh, and also, if it were to happen, could we actually treat it? So we can't obviously treat everything in space. So when we design the kind of risks, they call it the risk posture or the risk attitude, then you decide uh, what's going to happen, how likely is it to happen, can we treat it? And then you make decisions about your medical capability based on what you're expecting to happen. 
and how you're expecting to to treat those things. Um, for obvious reasons, treating medical conditions in space is is no no easy task. Um, on ISS, we have the luxury of real-time communications. We have lots of data transfer. We can control medical devices uh, remotely. Um, we can also bring people home and have them in hospital in about 36 hours or so. Once we go into low Earth orbit, immediately we introduce uh, delays in evacuation. We get time delays in communications. And of course, as you can imagine, on the way to Mars, there's no coming back. Um, there's no communication other than with you know tens of minutes of time delay. So um, everything will be, uh, the amount of autonomy will increase and increase until for a Mars mission, the crew need to essentially look after themselves for almost all aspects of their, their health. Um, we will never be able to have every capability on board a, a space vehicle. Um, in terms of kind of cellular things, will we be able to grow tissues in space? Potentially, yes. Um, would we plan on doing that? For example, if there was a, you know, there's always a risk of fire in a vehicle, would we take the capability to grow skin, for example? Maybe. It will depend on the resources, but of course it will all depend on your ability to actually do the do the surgery or do the process that was required to replace the skin. Um, we do very limited actual medical invasive procedures on, on astronauts. I mean, we take, you know, they can take teeth out if they need to, but um, to actually do something so significant to actually use a use an in-flight grown medical material is, is a quite a significant challenge. Um, but like I said, they do need to be potentially completely autonomous in the future. Um, and so it's all a case of identifying what can be done, what's realistic and, and what sort of capability could be built into a, a vehicle of the future. Maybe uh, to add to that, um, and I think it's the same approach we have, for instance, with, with other solutions like life support systems, cultivated meat. We do address these kind of studies on, on, on um, what kind of technologies are there uh, also to familiarize with that and at, at, at the later stage also be in a, a, a position to justify in, a, in, in a, I mean, to, to, to decide in a justified way whether we can implement this on the long term or not, whether it has added value or not. So at, at, at some point in time when you're getting closer to a mission to Mars, you have to make these kind of trade-offs and uh, maybe to sacrifice a few things uh, uh, and, and, and keep another uh, few medical uh, solutions on board. Wow, okay, excellent answer. And I think you know, it, there was a discussion topic of what kind of communications is available and, and knowing that the ISS has you know, real-time communication so you can kind of communicate back and forth is, is super fascinating uh, and makes sense. Um, we have quite a, an interesting question uh, from an attendee who asks, uh, will the cultivated meat be considered G? Oh, um, will cu will cultivated meat be considered GM foods in the EU? That's a little bit of a loaded question, but maybe more. How is EU looking to regulate cultivated meat? I guess maybe a, a different way to answer that is, you know, if if cultivated meat is either GM or maybe not even um, kind of allowed on on from an EU regulation standpoint. Uh, how will that kind of be handled from a, a maybe not research, but more consumption standpoint uh, in the future? Um, I, I mean, this is, this is, I would say, one of, 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 of the most interesting topics, of course. I mean, you, you find it in different fields. Uh, you find it in... Uh, in autonomous driving, etc., it's uh, you get very innovative technologies, and uh, the next question is how do we look at uh, at the regulation for that? Um, I my understanding is, and I think uh, Joao has looked into that uh, also, is that of course it is ongoing, and what we see, uh, and um, I mean we're calling in uh, partly from uh, from the Netherlands uh, because I work at at, at Estec is also specifically the the Netherlands they are uh, I mean it's 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 becoming a high priority on the agenda uh, uh, so I would expect that there would be an acceleration in these regulations but it's uh, yeah I mean usually the regulatory aspects take a little bit more time than uh, than the technology developments uh, today I don't know Joao if you have any detail uh, for this uh, well, um, whether is GM or will be considered GM or not, I think that will depend on, on of course, the cell line or, or the cell type that will be used. Um, 
what Europe will do regarding regulation, I think uh, it's still too early to say, but it's uh, for sure that we're building momentum. So as Ross said in, in the Netherlands, uh, so uh, the government is working on, approve, on the approval of tastings uh, by the culture meat companies. And there was the government also uh, funded in about 60 million uh, research on cellular agriculture. So for sure, there's quite a big interest from the government uh, and the society to, to push this, these technologies. But of course, only, only the future will tell what will happen. Cool, thank you. And yeah, and we've definitely been seeing the Netherlands as kind of a, a leader in moving that space. So we'll hopefully see the rest of uh, uh, the EU follow. Um, I I saw I I had an uh, I saw a notification pop up from Larissa Zimbaroff. Um, if you do have a question, go ahead and put it in the QA. Otherwise, I think it just kind of flashed up on my screen. Um, and I want to ask about um, different types of research modules um, that are. Um, that are kind of sent over to either ISS or different types of missions. And you were mentioning that there would be this opportunity for self-cultured meat, some sort of bioreactor system, or, or actually um, some sort of 3D printing, uh, bioprinting system. Um, but right now, are there any kind of um, standard kind of um, research setups, or uh, I guess, you know, it's often referred to as some sort of box, right? Um, if there is different types of biotech research that is taking place, is there kind of some sort of standard in terms of capabilities or is everything custom? Uh, and I also want to mention, we've been hearing a lot about lab on a chip uh, for a little bit more smaller scale stuff, but any comments on what kind of, uh, I guess, units uh, for standard research takes place uh, at the ISS? Um, I mean, the... the, the, the... So let's let's have the the the, the type of research uh, and and the facilities we have and whether it's standard or not whether it's standard or not is is something which in space is uh, is changing day by day so so we don't really have I would say standard facilities uh, for any type of scientific research or or a technology demonstrator um, regarding the facilities which are uh, supporting this kind of applications um, uh, let, let me be very careful in the answer because I would like to invite then everyone to listen to the uh, presentation of Aleph because they've been recently doing experiments on the on the space station in one of the ESA uh, well, I would say in in um, in one of the European commercial uh, platforms, uh, experiment platforms, which has been developed as a public-private partnership between ESA and space applications in Belgium, and they've done an experiment on that. And I th I, I would like to uh, to give uh, Pascal the opportunity to introduce that to the audience. Excellent. And that presentation will be available at uh, 9 p.m. CET. So take a look uh, for that on the attendee agenda. Um, I think you know, so we have one more question from the audience regarding how is non-organic waste handled in space? Um, any comments on that? Non-organic? Um... Yeah, I mean, it's it's it, at the moment uh, we we are uh, we're having ISS and uh, International Space Station, and then usually the uh, the waste is collected and uh, is uh, is then brought to the uh, the visiting vehicles. So this might be a Dragon from SpaceX, it might be a Soyuz from the Russians, uh, a sickness module from Northern Grubben. Um There's a, I mean, the 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 Dragon uh, is returning. Uh, to Earth, so it's usually bringing experiment results to Earth. So it has no added value to bring waste to that. But the others are usually uh, just burning in in the atmosphere, and they bring the waste to these modules. So it burns. Uh, they 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 are going back. They they're brought back into the atmosphere, and then they uh, they burn. Interesting. Thank you. So that's it for the Q and A session we have. If there are any additional questions, there will be the opportunity to connect with the speakers and again, review the, the presentation as well. Uh, I wanna thank you, Rob and the team for, for joining us. And I think that this is you know, a great way not only to kick off what we're doing here at CMS Astro, but also very inspiring to see that there are so many opportunities to either work with ESA or find other funding opportunities for research in space. So thank you very much. Thanks on our side.
and uh, a, uh, much success with the uh, remainder of the CMS Astro. Uh, looking forward to uh, listening in and uh, see the presentations. Yeah.